So without further ado, uh, Ken Mortsugu, uh, he is moderator for this panel. He's also former AAJ Asia president and also bureau chief for Tokyo for uh, the Associated Press. So Ken, take it away, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back for the afternoon session. I just want to start off by saying it's really wonderful to be back here for now our fourth conference here at uh, Hong Kong University. And uh, it's, it's been a, every year I come, the conference seems to get bigger and more professionally done and with more and more uh, dynamic, exciting sessions and, and, and speakers. So it's, it's a real pleasure to, to, to be here and, and to host, to be invited to, to moderate one of these panels. Um, the panel today, as, as I think you all know, is it's called uh, the Alu debacle, um, but it's more broadly about um, Asian, Asian security and issues uh, facing Asia today. And we have a really fine uh, group of panelists here that have been, uh, that have come, some have flown in from out of town to, to be with us today. So let me just start by uh, briefly introducing them. Um, on the, the far end, there is an, actually an old friend of mine, Yoichi Kato, who's a very senior security correspondent for the Asahi Shimbun. Um, we actually, I actually knew Yoichi and we were both cub reporters. Um, I was at the Japan Times, he was at the much more prestigious Asai Shimbun, um, but we knew each other in Tokyo and were, and were friends from, from back then. Um, he has since gone on to be the um, bureau chief of Asahi's American General Bureau in Washington, D.C. Um, until 2009. Um, from 2001 to 2002, he was a visiting research fellow at both the Institute for National Strategic Studies of National Defense University and the Center for Strategic International Studies in Washington, D.C. Um, he earned his MA from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, he has taught a course on national security strategy at Gakushin University in Tokyo, and he publishes both in Japanese and English, and some of his works have been published in China as well. Um, next to uh, Yoichi is John Liu, who is Bloomberg's managing editor for the greater China region, overseeing more than 120 reporters and editors in Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, and Taipei. Um, he has been, he's worked in China for more than a decade, writing about the economy, government policy, capital markets, and companies. Uh, John joined Bloomberg in 2006 as a technology correspondent, became Shanghai bureau chief in 2008, Beijing bureau chief in 2010, and now the managing editor for Greater China since the end of 2013. Um, on, next to John is Dmitry uh, Sevastopoulos, who's the South China regional correspondent for the Financial Times. Uh, he covers South China, Taiwan, Chinese relations with Southeast Asia, and the terrorist hold disputes in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, from 2009 to 2013, Dmitry was the FT's Asia news editor running a network of editors and correspondents in Asia and serving as global news editor during the Asian day. Dimitri was previously based in Washington as a Pentagon and CIA correspondent and has reported from Afghanistan, Iraq, China, India, Indonesia, Mongolia, Algeria, and Cuba. So pretty much everywhere that, uh, that, there's, that there's been conflict in the world and now in Hong Kong. And in a former life, he was a currency trader at Citibank. So interesting background. Um, next to uh, Dimitri is uh, another old friend of mine, Steve Herman, who's the Voice of America Bureau Chief in Bangkok. And prior to that, he, w he had the, held the same position in Seoul, and, uh, where he served for more than three, oh, sorry, and before that, for, he served for more than three years as VOA's South Asia Bureau Chief in New Delhi. Um, Steve is uh, probably well known to many of you for his uh, very active Twitter account, um, at W7VOA, in case you don't know. And his, uh, uh, in initially, became very popular during Japan's earthquake and tsunami disaster when his tweets were widely cited by numerous media outlets around the world. And finally, on, uh, right next to me is Greg Turode, who's the Hong Kong-based Reuters special correspondent covering regional politics and security. Um, the South China Sea dispute has long been a feature of his work, dating to the mid-1990s, when he was based in Vietnam for the South China Morning Post. He has traveled widely across the region and also been based in Bangkok and Washington, D.C. So that's our, that's our panel today. Sorry, I can move the mic from my mouth. Um, the, uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, all of you to, to think about one thing, so I'm going to come back and ask you guys a, a question a little bit later, um, which is um, what do you think uh, the chance of war is in either the South China Sea or the East China Sea? And uh, do you think it's likely? Is it more than 50%? Do you think it's possible, maybe 10 to 25 percent? 
you think it's fairly unlikely, like maybe one, two percent kind of thing. So just think about that a little bit. We'll come back and do a little survey afterwards and ask our panelists the same question. And, and uh, let me just say one thing. Let me just say one thing. When, um, when, I, when, we, when we say war, sometimes we think of, you know, I don't know, the Vietnam War or some, you know, some huge conflict kind of thing. So I'm not talking about something like that, but just the idea of armed conflict. Do you think that there, there's a good chance, a, a possible chance, or hardly any chance of armed conflict um, in the region, say, in the next five years? Um, I wanted to uh, so start just by um, kind of having our panelists bring us up to date on the latest uh, developments in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And we'll start with the South China Sea, where I'm sure you're um, aware of the uh, conflict that developed after the uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese oil company moved an oil rig into disputed waters um, off of Vietnam um, and, and the various events that, that uh, followed that. And also, uh, at the same time last month, uh, the Philippines uh, revealed or announced that uh, China had been uh, reclaiming land uh, around a disputed reef. Um, this is not something that necessarily started, I think it started a few months ago and it's been kind of building over time, but for whatever reason, the Philippines decided to announce that last month. Um, so I wanted to uh, start with uh, Greg, who's been covering uh, these issues for such a long time, and um, ask him to talk about these events and any other, we're talking about some other recent events that were that are happening even as we speak sort of thing. And uh, is there some sort of escalation of, of what's, of, of this sort of long running kind of tension or is this just a continuation of, of events? Thanks, Ken. Um, to answer your first question, yeah, it is both a continuum and an escalation. Issue really brings to the fore a lot of the, a lot of the tensions and the fears in the way that the South China Sea could develop. It goes beyond the South China Sea. It speaks to China's desire to assert itself as rising power. Back in 2010, um, Barack Obama turned up at APEC, I think, in uh, Yokohama, and how important it was for the region and the U.S. to shape China's rise. I think what we're seeing is the reverse, and I think we're seeing China trying to shape the region's perception of the rise of China. It's showing itself to be um, not one to be quickly done by anybody. Um, it created its own space in the region, and it seems to be right to get some respect for its security concerns. whole of East Asia. Um, is that better? Yeah. yeah. I think we can see the South China Sea. It's, it's both a, an immediate pressing issue, but it, it speaks to those wider issues as well. Um, I think very definitely um, there is a chance of conflict, maybe not a, a huge conflict developing over the South China Sea, but uh, we can see already fears of, of miscalculation and accidents leading uh, to some sort of skirmish, if not, if not a wholesale war. That's been a long-term uh, worry of strategic analysts in the region, and I think um, the oil rig certainly brings that to the fore, where Vietnam is openly challenging uh, the placement of the oil rig, saying that it's, it's basically, it falls within um, Vietnam's exclusive economic zone off its coast. Um, we don't see much that ASEAN is able to do in a meaningful fashion questionable whether the emerging legal infrastructure through the United Nations law is also able to, um, to have an impact. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Why it's interesting that China's taken on the, the Vietnamese over this. The Philippines, of course, has the issue of, um, has the, issue of the fact that it's a U.S. treaty partner security treaty just like Japanese so it's unlikely that you know China's going to run too quickly to create a full-blown conflict the Vietnamese are much more isolated 
they have an internationalist foreign policy, they're nobody's allies, um, they're nobody's, um, they would never let foreign military be based in Vietnam anymore. So China's really sort of pushing, um, pushing the envelope, you could say. Uh, it's looking for a reaction, uh, and it seems to be getting one from the Vietnamese. Um, it's interesting that the Vietnamese said that they not fire the first shot, but if something kicks off, they're not going to stand back and watch. Uh, they've said that repeatedly. It hasn't got a lot of attention, um, but it's quite significant that they are saying they are prepared to, to fight back. Domestically, they have to say that. They would almost have to put up some sort of a fight, just as Taiwan, for example, is very important uh, to the Chinese. Um, the Vietnamese internal propaganda script uh, has been written very heavily around the South China Sea. So the party for its own uh, future stability and survival, you could say, if something kicked off in the South China Sea, the Communist Party of Vietnam would have to make sure Vietnamese military response was at least significant. Not that they ever believed they could, they could necessarily defeat China, but they would have to go down fighting. So it's it's really quite a fascinating scenario. Probably wrap it up there. I think there's a, a, a tremendous irony in China's assertiveness. You could argue that for a period of time, uh, America's interest in the region was beginning to suffer from benign neglect, and now what do you have happen, happen have happening? This uh, Asia pivot, and uh, the Philippines uh, essentially welcoming U.S. forces back to the country, which it kicked out. And uh, I might disagree with you slightly about Vietnam. There have been indications that they would welcome. Uh, some sort of uh, foreign military uh, presence uh, utilizing Cameron Bay now. And so you have the I irony that possibly we could see uh, American naval vessels uh, uh, docking in uh, Vietnam in the future. So, uh, you know, there's also this argument about whether China is actually uh, seeking to upset the entire world order and uh, have a bipolar world with China leading one side of it, uh, sort of in the in the Cold War model. I, I I am not convinced that that's what China is after, but the assertiveness in its own uh, backyard and what uh, China claims as its uh, uh, own waters, uh, I I think is a awaking a, a new potential type of uh, Asia Pacific alliance with the United States being a, a very formidable presence in this century. I just, I just add one thing. While all of that is true, if you look back to 2012, uh, there was a standoff at Scarborough Shoal in the South China Sea between the Philippines and China. For about a month, you had uh, ships on both sides kind of uh, locked facing down each other. The Philippines wanted the US to come and help. They wanted to see US ships turn up on the horizon and they didn't come. And the reason they didn't come was because the White House decided that that would be too provocative and they didn't want to risk a conflict with China or being drawn into a conflict with China over very small islands with the Philippines. Even though the Philippines is a treaty ally, it's not a treaty ally on the same level that Japan is. It's not as important. It doesn't provide the same toehold in Asia for US troops, Marines, ships, planes, etc. at least not right now. Um, and so I think China watches every time it tests Japan or the Philippines or Vietnam, it watches to see what is the response from that country, what is the response from everyone else in the region, and what is the response from the US. And I think China feels more confident now than it's done in a long time. And on the military side, it also has more capabilities. About 10 years ago, China had about 30 Coast Guard ships. Uh, it's adding 14 this year. By the end of this year, it'll have 60, and it's got another 30-something that have been ordered. So very quickly, China's adding the capability to do things in the South China Sea that it's probably wanted to do for a long time, but just physically couldn't. And I think all of that adds up to um, a much more tense environment. I don't think there's going to be a deliberate conflict where someone in a capital says, let's attack someone else. But I think what's much more likely and quite scary is accidental conflict where something happens, particularly at the Senkaku Diaoyu, that escalates out of control and is very difficult for uh, nationalist leaders in both Japan and China 
to get back under control. So to me, that's the, that's the biggest danger in the region. Um, I would just say that, to me, the situation is the new normal and unavoidable. And I think it's unavoidable in the sense that I think you have countries that are China's neighbors waking up. And you know, in, you know, in five to 10 years, which is fairly quick in the scope of history, finding that China is now their, their top or their second trading partner. And that completely changes the relationship that one country has with another. And I think people are awakening to the fact that there is this interdependence now. And with that comes sort of a new calculus for how you relate with China. And I think that's that, that relationship, you know, unless there's some sort of crisis in China economically, that's just going to be more and more weighted in that direction. And so I think probably things will get tenser before, you know, before they get any better. Yeah, from the Japan's point of view, uh, I, I don't agree with John. Uh, in economic interdependence doesn't really prevent war. If you look at the history, even during the, before the World War I, there's enormous interdependence among those countries which went into war. Because the, the mechanism of, of the <coughs> break of the war is totally different from economic interdependence. And I, I totally agree with the, what Dimitri said. Uh, uh, it could uh, really go into unintended escalation and the political leadership of each country will have a really hard time to stop it. I just <coughs> want to present, uh, introduce you a couple of a public opinion poll which ex explain exactly why uh, what Dimitri said. One is an opinion poll that uh, Okinawa prefecture government conducted and uh, it, it shows that Okinawans are more pro-American than the mainlander in Japan and more afraid of China than the uh, mainlanders in Japan. And the conventional view is that o o people in Okinawa are anti-America because they suffer enormous burden of uh, US forces in, on their island and also uh, pro-China because they are close to China. And actually one of the cables uh, leaked by WikiLeaks 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, which was you know, uh, written by Consul General of uh, Naha, United States, sent to Washington, D.C., said exactly that. The Okinawans are so anti-American and pro-China, it's hard to uh, <coughs> push the uh, U.S. politic policies. But actually, the, this public opinion found that they're totally different, uh, totally the other way around. The Okinawans are more pro-America pro than mainland in Japan and, and uh, more afraid of China. And uh, the, the question I asked is uh, whether uh, military conflict are likely to break out in East China Sea. Exactly the question that uh, uh, Ken asked uh, to you at the outset. And uh, among the Okinawans, more than 50%, 51.0% of them said that uh, it's likely. While the uh, overall Japan average was only 23.7%. And as you know, the Senkaku, the Aoyu Island, belongs to Okinawa Prefecture and the Japanese uh, administrative system. So those Okinawans uh, are more uh, really worried about uh, uh, what is going to happen uh, in uh, East China Sea right now because of what China is doing. And the other uh, public opinion poll that I would like to uh, touch upon is uh, uh, <coughs> the recent uh, survey uh, conducted by CSIS at the Washington DC. And uh, it, it uh, asked uh, uh, the policy expert of the 10 countries uh, plus Taiwan in this region uh, if you know, uh, another country sees your nation's sovereign territory and uh, assuming that diplomacy didn't solve the crisis, would you support your government to use force to retake it? And the answer was, overall the average was 81% uh, 80, of the respondent, all those policy experts said yes, they would support the use of force to retake the, uh, you know, the territory. Uh, and uh, that striking point is, Japan was no different. As you know, Japan has a constitution which renounces the use of force as a means to settle the international dispute. But, you know, Japan, uh, among the Japanese policy experts, 81% support, supported uh, use of force. And uh, China, 83%. And uh, one of those uh, uh, the diplomat uh, from Southeast Asia countries was shocked to see this uh, result because, you know, if Japan and China both the experts both support the use of force 81, more than 80%. That means war, right? But that's, this is the reality. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, <coughs> what's happening in East China Sea and perhaps in South China Sea, uh, and to put it more bluntly, what China is doing in uh, the maritime doing domain in East Asia has substantially changed the sense of security among the Japanese 
and also their attitude to use of force as a means to uh, deal with the military conflict. So I think uh, the, this, these are results of the uh, public opinion poll shows the urgent necessity uh, for Japan and China to set up a both conflict prevention and crisis management me mechanism to avoid the disaster that nobody in the region would want and benefit. Sorry, I, just, I, was, I was actually saying when the, uh, the economic relationship grows, it actually generates tension because let's say like Japan's case, Japan used to, you know, sort of China overtaking the U.S. to become Japan's top trading partner. That, that puts Japan in a position where the relationship with China has changed, right? And now I think that increases tension because now the impact that the Chinese can have on Japan has increased substantially. Yeah, is this? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I can hear the difference now. Thank you. The, um, I was just saying, I think the tensions actually can be generated by greater dependence economically. Because if, if my country is dependent on your country for my economic well-being, then you have great influence over me. And so, you know, I have to kind of decide, am I going to allow that influence to grow or am I going to try to change course so that influence is reduced? So I think that, that causes tension. Thank you. L let me go back to uh, something Dimitri brought up, which was the Scarborough show incident and um, how the U.S. chose at that time not to, uh, to get involved and, and have a show of force. Um, at, at what point... Do you or, or do the other panels think that the U.S. might get involved and might actually say, we need to, you know, we're going to do something? Um, and sort of the opposite end of that question is with the uh, Dalyu Senkaku. You know, is there, what is the chance that the U.S. actually might not, might get cold feet and might not uh, honor its treaty obligation? Uh, with, the, with the Philippines, uh, I think, I'd have to look at the language, but I think the treaty says there has to be an attack on Metro Manila or on a Philippine ship. And there's one of the funny things about what's happening at the moment, there's a ship called the Sierra Madre, which was run aground in 1999 on one of the um, disputed reefs. And it was done deliberately because the Philippines wanted to assert their claim in the area. The ship has never been decommissioned. So the Philippines military says quietly, uh, if that ship is attacked or dislodged off the reef, uh, that will invoke the US-Philippine security treaty. I don't think anyone in Washington sees it that way. So I think there's probably a little bit of overconfidence in the Philippines as to what would trigger U.S. involvement in any kind of a conflict or um, clash with uh, China. Uh, Japan is different. Japan, the Japan-U.S. relationship and the security relationship is the cornerstone of the security relationship, excuse me, of, of security in the region, wh whether China uh, likes it or not has been for decades. And if the US did not come to Japan's defense, if there was some kind of a clash with China, then basically no one in the region would believe anything the US said in terms of the pivot or supporting allies or et cetera uh, for a long time. So I think that's, that worries the US more because the potential for something to happen at Senkaku de Ayu, an accidental conflict that would require the US to get involved is something that Washington really wants to avoid. Um, but at the moment, there's very little they can do to try and uh, de-escalate tensions. Over the last six months, it's interesting, the, the number of Chinese ships coming into the 12-mile nautical zone around the islands has, has decreased um, relatively significantly. And some people say that means China is trying to tone things down. Uh, people I talk to in Japan, and, and Kato-san can talk more about this, say there are two things going on. One is a lot of Chinese ships have been diverted to the South China Sea. And they don't have that many ships still. Uh, and the other thing is the weather around the Senkaku this time of the year is not conducive to, to sailing around the islands. So it may simply be that we have to wait till the summer and things will pick up again. But everyone is watching that, I think, probably more closely than anything else in the region because the potential for conflict is most, I would say, significant there. I'll just add one quick point on what Dimitri said about the Senkaku Diao Yu area, and that's also to watch um, the aerial incursions as well. It's, it's just not um, sea-based, but there's also a lot of activity going on uh, in the skies as well. Yeah, and, and since you brought that up, let's just mention briefly that the most recent incident in the skies uh, 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 in which the, uh, 
uh, Chinese fighter jets approached uh, Japanese surveillance planes that were watching a uh, China-Russia joint uh, exercise. And it was certainly played up in Japan as you know a very risky situation uh, and, and so forth. And I think even I saw Top Gun language or something kind of kind of headlines sort of thing. So I just it, was that was that incident different from the other incidents, and is that something new in, in what's going on? I, I think that's what John was describing as the new normal. I mean, the, the U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, I asked him about that in Singapore last weekend, and he said, "Well, actually, it's not really dangerous. What the Chinese did." To Japan, they do to us all the time. The U.S. flies spy planes off Hainan Island and up and down the coast. Chinese fighter jets engage them. They get very close. In the Cold War, the Russians and the Americans did it. They got extremely close. So I think what's happening is Japan is not used to being buzzed by uh, fighter aircraft from other countries. Uh, China is now starting to do it. So I think that's not so much that it's dangerous, it's that it's new. And when something's new, both sides need to learn how they're going to deal with each other when you're flying at that kind of speed and that kind of proximity to each other, it is dangerous in that sense. But I don't think it's going to, um, I think that is the new normal. One quick note to that. Uh, during the Cold War, with those Soviet-US encounters, there were accidents and there were incidents. They did not lead to World War III, but we really haven't seen anything like this in, in recent history, so it'll be very interesting when there is the inevitable accident or incident to, to see how the governments react to it. Yeah, one of the reasons, Steve, they didn't, uh lead to World War III was that the US and the Soviet Union had very strict uh, security protocols, um, both for ships at sea and uh, also, also air. Um, the ships at sea one was very interesting because it, it ties back to China right now. Um, they both, basically both sides acknowledged that they could go into each other's economic zones for surveillance purposes, uh, and they would do this a lot submarines and surface ships. It would be US submarines, uh, sorry, Russian submarines right off Hawaii, um, which is obviously a very significant uh, US base, for example. Now, China has never really started discussions with the US on this, and there's kind of quite a big difference of opinion. China does not like uh, US surveillance of the, of the air and the sea uh, off its coasts, even within the exclusive economic zone. And this is a big uh, difference of opinion over the UN law of the sea. But as this issue progresses, it's going to have to be sorted out. And there's no clear way how it's going to be sorted out. So that's just one little piece that shows us just how awkward uh, these rising tensions are because they're not taking place. They're, they're sort of taking place in an evolving uh, arena. Um, things haven't been worked out as they, have, as they were in the Cold War. Yeah, uh, from, from Japan's point of view, this uh, incident uh, happened uh, over the uh, sky of the Southeast China Sea. It was really dangerous because, number one, uh, uh, Japanese uh, maritime uh, air self defense force is not uh, used to have uh, that kind of what we call air harassment by Chinese air, air force or Navy fighter uh, jets as the U.S. Navy uh, is. So it was, we, uh, as a, to, to, to be quite a fair and honest as a journalist, we still don't know what exactly what what happened at that time, but from what we what we learned from the Japanese government side, the Chinese air, fighter aircraft get close to as as close as 30, 30 meters, and uh, you can imagine that uh, you know flying at the, that kind of speed, uh, thirty meters is really close, and it could it could uh, develop into the kind of situation EP three uh, incident two thousand two, and it was really dangerous, and. Uh, and the other point I want to make is it really shows uh, how uh, <clears throat> the incident in, in the air uh, could be uh, more dangerous than uh, uh, in the sea. Because as, as, as we all know, what's happening uh, in the sea is an encounter uh, with uh, the law enforcement agency uh, vessels. Um, both, both China and Japan, uh, we deploy uh, Coast Guard, constabulary agencies. Now, even though the Navy ships are in the vicinity and watching, but they never come into uh, the <clears throat> territorial water or adjacent water to encounter each other. What we all see is uh, uh, Chinese uh, Coast Guard ships and Japanese Coast Guard ships chasing, chasing each other around, right? But in the air, we don't have any constabulary. We don't have any Coast Guard uh, uh, aircraft. And China may have a little bit small number of 
But actually, what we, we have seen as an incident, there is a direct contact with the uh, uh, Chinese Air Force and Japanese uh, Air Sail Defense Force. So there is no margin of error. And uh, the, the time is also uh, limited to, to, uh, to respond. So it could uh, really instantly develop into the actual military conflict. And, uh, but there is no uh, the agreement between China and Japan to deal with uh, uh, the conflict re uh, prevention or crisis management, as I said. And Japan has been constantly asking uh, or proposing China to enter into that kind of agreement that China uh, uh, never uh, agreed to do it. So the air is really uh, dangerous, and I would not dare, dare to predict anything, but that there are more danger, uh, something would happen in the air. Thank you. So all, all this is sounding pretty scary, and uh, I have a feeling I should have done my survey before you heard from the, the journalists and the experts. But let, let's have a, a show of hands here. There are basically three choices. Do you think that armed conflict is um, is more likely than not, is, is, uh, the chances are greater than 50%. Do you think it's um, less likely than not, but still fairly possible, say 10 to 25% kind of thing, or do you think it's fairly unlikely um, in the one to 2% range? So first of all, who thinks it's um, more likely than not, greater than 50% chance there'll be some armed conflict in the next 50 years? Sorry, five years. Five, oh, five years. <laughs> I ch okay, so we have about, uh, I don't know, 10 hands or so, I think, out there? Okay. And who's, uh, who are the fence sitters, the 15, the 10 to 25 percent who think there's a good chance, but not, not more than likely? All right. Uh, maybe about 20 hands or so, or 25 hands. And who thinks it's really unlikely that, you know, that this is not going to happen, that n neither, n none of these countries would risk having a, a, a war? That's interesting. So. About 10, would you say? So I, th I think we're kind of, everyone's in, uh, the, the big group's in the middle, but there are people on, on, on sort of both ends. So I, I just want to ask our panelists, uh, how do you see that? Uh, if I put the question to you, what is, do you agree with, with what the, the audience is saying? I, um, I'm kind of quite pessimistic about the South China Sea and more optimistic about the Senkaku values because in case Japan, China, the US, the stakes are so high. There are red lines, perhaps I can be contradicted on this, but there are, there are apparent red lines over which either side isn't going to go. Um, the South China Sea is a little more fluid. I'm not saying it's going to be a conflict that would lead to a full-blown war, but there, there could be conflict. Um, we should remind ourselves that it's, it's not the Korean, it's, it's, not the, it's not North Korea, we're not talking about a, an emerging nuclear-armed permit state here. It's not the um, Indian-Pakistan territorial dispute, which is also nuclear-armed. Um, it's, uh, it's not quite on that scale. But we could see, we could see a conflict. Um, and history, recent history isn't a great guide here uh, for peace. Uh, in 1974, uh, China took the Paracels, or, or what part of the Paracel Islands that it, it didn't occupy, it took them from South Vietnam just before the end of the Vietnam War. Um, Hanoi, of course, was China's ally at that time and, and felt it couldn't really protest. South Vietnam protested, but South Vietnam didn't exist within a matter of months, so that was lost to history. Um, then in 1988, there was a sea battle. Uh, that's not that long ago for, for older folks in the audience. Um, Asia's last, or Southeast Asia's last sea battle, um, in which China took uh, its first possessions in the Spratly Islands in the south of the South China Sea from Vietnam. Uh, those are those islands that they are starting to, um, on second South Johnson Reef, that it's starting to reclaim and build up now. So, you know, there is, there is signs here that, uh, you know, a conflict in the South China Sea wouldn't be without precedence. And the situation with the, the Philippines-US treaty is, is definitely fluid and deliberately ambiguous, as Stephen and, and Dimitri pointed out. Um, one assumes that if, if China tried what it did at Scarborough now, it would be a slightly different picture. Um, but I think we're probably going to see more of these kind of incidents rather than less um, under Xi Jinping's rule. Um, 
I grew up in Las Vegas, so I'm cognizant of odds. And when we're talking about making bets, I look at the odds. And if you're offering a straight up proposition over the next five years, I certainly would not bet against a hostile exchange of fire between two sides in either of the seas. Uh, I actually think that the East China Sea, the Senkaku Dayu, for reasons that we've discussed up here, that there's a much more likely chance of there being this, this hostile exchange of fire. But, uh, in, in with the, and then that's more of a, a Japan-China proposition. And in the South China Sea, what is actually the danger there, it's just not one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You've got China vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Vietnam, as well as other countries, which uh, are, are the Spratleys are, I don't know, six or seven countries when you count Republic of China and Brunei, and it's, it's five, seven? Five claiming the Spratleys. Right. So, yeah, so we don't know a year from now, there, there may be another player uh, involved in this picture because of something provocative uh, that, that China has, has placed uh, in, in the waters as well. Uh, the one thing I learned in my short career as a currency trader is that anyone who tells you they know what's going to happen is probably making it up. So I, I have no idea, but I do think it's a lot tenser now than it used to be. And I would also say that the Chinese, regardless of what's happening in the South China Sea, the Chinese and Xi Jinping, they really don't like Abe. And I think... <laughs> I, <laughs> and vice versa. But you have two very nationalist leaders there, so I think that makes the Diao Yusenkak situation a lot more dangerous than it was, let's say, before both of those leaders came into power. Incidentally, at the Shangri-La Defense Forum last weekend, Kato San and I were both there. As far as I can tell, there was very little discussion at all between the Japanese and the Chinese. And I, I sat in between a senior Japanese intelligence officer and a senior Chinese colonel, both of whom spoke very good English. And in the five or six hours that we sat there, they neither exchanged business cards, gave each other a glance, shook hands, said hello, or anything. And I felt like a minnow in Asia. But <laughs> so I, I would say the chances of there being an incident are probably quite high. I think the chances of there being a, a continued conflict of some sort are fairly low, I would uh -huh. say. And hopefully, uh, if an incident incident were to occur, that there, the, the repercussions of that would actually calm everybody down a little bit. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's something that there's a lot of people thinking about now. And so hopefully that means this thing goes through without any big hiccups, I would say. Uh, I, I'm a, a military expert, so I, I like to point this out. You know, what, what the, the challenge that we are facing right now is a low intensity provocation situation. It, we are not really talking about the uh, all out war between, you know, full fledged war between militaries. What, what you know, the, the, the danger we are really facing is uh, what we call a gray zone scenario. It's, it's, it's not the military to military uh, 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 showdown. But as I said, you know, law enforcement agencies, uh, you know, uh, facing each other and may uh, escalate into a full fledged uh, conflict. And the problem is, you know, we, we don't have a deterrence to stop, prevent this kind of gray zone conflict or low intensity scenario. So we are really f facing a totally new situation where we could go into a really dangerous uh, zone without really knowing how to control it. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, also ask Kato-san about North Korea, but we're running out of time. Um, he has some very interesting things to say about the, the recent uh, developments with, between Japan and North Korea and the abductions issue. So if anybody has any, wants to hear about that, please ask that in the, in the question and answer. So why don't we turn now to questions and from the audience and start up front here. Okay, so my name is Chae Wancho from Seoul, South Korea, and thank you all of your panels and speakers for your insights of the companies having these days. But I want to hear some very brief thinking about the disputes happening these days on 
the Dokdo and the Takeshima issues. Are there having similarities between the Dyer and the Santa Cruz disputes? And what's your thinking of this? This can be resolved as soon as possible these days right now. So I want to hear some brief insights of this. Thank you. I'll defer to Kato-san for the bulk of the answer on this. But I would just say that uh, you have to recognize Japan has territorial disputes with all of its neighbors. And because of the historical legacy, it's been very difficult for Japan to sort of take the upper moral ground. And a lot of these arguments, if you look at the press, I, I've worked both, lived both in Korea and Japan, and the media in both countries look at these issues, generally speaking, with rare exception, through a very narrow nationalistic prism. And you'll see stories about this map being pulled out and that map being pulled out. And I am so sick and tired of all these old maps because anybody can come up with old maps and old documents. And with the, uh, the, the Dokdo Takashima issue, I have absolutely no doubt that that one is not going to be settled uh, anytime soon. There, there's just too much emotion on both sides for there to be any a movement. The best we can hope for is if we have certain leaders in both capitals, in Seoul and in Tokyo, that they may agree to just you know, keep it uh, uh, from, from boiling for a period of time. But I'm very pessimistic of any sort of settlement. Well, I, I think from Japan's point of view, uh, I don't think uh, Dokto Takeshima issue is not going to uh, be serious as uh, uh, Senkaku. The reason is simple. Japan doesn't challenge the de facto control of uh, Takeshima by Korea. Japan doesn't challenge the de facto control of Northern Territory by Russia. Japan never challenges uh, the de facto control of other countries on these disputed uh, territories. Only China challenges Japan's you know, de, de facto control. So this is, the, this is the difference. So if China takes the same approach as Japan does, I think we don't have you know, too much trouble. I, I don't think territorial issue will not solve anytime soon because it involves a sovereignty. So ne neither country can really make a compromise. So the best thing is you know, how we can you know, keep it down, the tension. And uh, I hope the wisdom uh, prevails. Let me, I think there's a question here, but why don't we go here? Thank you. My name is Anne Kruger from the JMSC at Hong Kong U. Um, we've heard a lot today about national pride and geographical lines in the military, but I'd just like some more comments from you on the panel about um, what lies beneath, if you like, the natural resources and the potential financial bonanza. Um, do you have any sort of comments about how much um, that is really, um, you know, figuring in, in the dispute as well? Um, if you look back over his, if you look back over history, the, the dis I mean, China and its neighbours have had disputes over lots of islands and reefs, etc., in the South China Sea, for a long time. Uh, it's not new. Uh, but what's happened is in the 60s and 70s, there were studies and, and surveys done about the kind of seismic, sorry, the um, energy resources under the South China Sea in particular. And I think after that, a lot of countries became a lot more assertive in staking claims. Um, we don't know how much is there. And for example, the, Ch the Chinese oil rig that's off the Paracel Islands right now, one of the things that they're trying to do is work out, well, how much oil and gas is in that area. Um, but we don't really know. And it's, it's, there is joint drilling being done by some companies. Your Exxon's got uh, platforms in the region, so do other companies. But I don't think anyone really knows for sure uh, how much is there. But the potential is there, and that's why everyone is so kind of excited about it. Just to follow on on what Dimitri was saying, there is significant oil there um, already off to the fringes in non-disputed parts. Uh, south of Hong Kong, there's gas. Uh, south Vietnam, off, off South Vietnam, there's, there's significant oil. That's, in fact, Vietnam's biggest source of foreign revenue. Um, there, there is significant amounts there, it's known. Um, it's just the total amount and uh, that's not known it's never really been adequately surveyed out in the middle of the South China Sea and, and around the Spratleys. 
um, but there's enough there for there's enough thought to be there for people to be very interested. Um, one of the issues is that also it might be quite hard to get at through the, the geological structure and so on, but there's been a lot of advancements in that area in recent years, meaning that, that the South China Sea is probably more important than it once would have been. Um, why don't we go up there to the woman in white? Well, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Nancy from Phoenix TV. Um, my question is that um, last month I read an article by the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, and he said that international law was made during the time when China was weak, so kind of unfair. So, but nowadays ch things has changed. So China is like a rising power. So that's why China emphasized quite a lot of more on history because he. Maybe China want more fire, and also I think this um, concern is quite popular among a lot of Chinese. So I wonder, what's your opinion on that? Thank you. I, I was very intrigued to read that um, Lee Kuan Yew piece. I think if we're talking about the same piece, it was in Forbes magazine. Um, I was really surprised at it because it was always my impression that Lee Kuan Yew had been very skeptical of the Nine Dash Line previously, uh, and going way back to the 90s, had urged China to clarify the Nine Dash Line um, in order to sort of solve potential future troubles in the region. Uh, so I was kind of a little bit surprised to see that piece. Um, um, but uh, certainly the historic argument is very strong in the minds of Chinese strategists and, and Chinese lawyers quite how they're going to align that with the UN law of the sea and the 12 miles of territory, 200 miles of economic zone and international waters uh, is going to be very interesting to watch in the next few years. Um, I think a lot of international lawyers are trying to figure out you know, how China's going to get over that potential headache. I was just going to say that you know, uh, rules, if they were made in the past, and now in the future, or you know, now in the present, there's a feeling that the rules when they were made were unfair. Does, is not justification to change the rules? Uh, you know, maybe there is justification for changes, but I don't know if that's exactly uh, the best one. And just quickly, there's also an element of, of China taking its superpower prerogative here. Um, it doesn't necessarily like the UN law of the sea, and as a big power, it's acting in such a way that it, it may never actually follow it. Um, and it has a precedence here because the US has never signed or ratified the UN law of the sea. Even though it adopts it as a government bureaucratically essentially, the Navy essentially follows it. Um, but we can see that the US as a superpower doesn't like to sort of submit itself unless it really has to, to something like a uh, UN convention. So there's an element to which China may not necessarily want to change things um, or rewrite them necessarily. It might be trying to get itself powerful enough so it can ignore them. That's another factor that I think we might be seeing at play. Um, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, but why don't we uh, take a question there from the, from the woman who's... What I'm observing here is that the media seems to be quite powerless um, in terms of influencing the outcomes of a, you know, a conflict. In most of the other sessions, you know, we talk about media having an impact on the real world, whereas when it comes to military conflict, um, I'm seeing media kind of just an, taking an observatory role. So my question is, um, can the media be in any way proactive in changing the course of a potential military conflict? Um, it probably could, but I don't think that's the media's role. The media's role is to report on what's happening and what it's seeing. Um, we're not advocates. We're not activists. I'm not saying there aren't people in the media who do play those roles. They do exist, but the mainstream media, that's not what we're supposed to do. Um, and I'm not sure that we would be very good at it. So if we tried, I think it would be disastrous. 
I would just say, if you look at the media in Japan and China, <laughs> I, I would disagree. I think they do play a role and maybe the, not the best for peaceful international resolution of these issues. I, uh, as a Japanese press, uh, press person, I, I, I don't agree with him. Because, you know, if... if you, you work for the liberal Asahi, you're accepted. No, no, okay. No, I mean, you know, if the one, cool, core of the problem with Senkaku, the ideal issue, is wh what intention the Japanese government had to na nationalize the island. And the China, China is accusing Japan of you know, provoking uh, 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 Japan by changing the status quo. But what happened is, if you really look uh, into the actual uh, uh, sequence of things happened was, as some of you may know, there is a really nationalistic, provocative uh, 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 governor of Tokyo, Ishihara, tried to purchase it. And, uh, and the Japanese government at that time, not the administration, trying to prevent Ishihara from taking that kind of provocative action. So in place of governor, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Central Government of Japan purchased it. So it was a way to prevent the provocation. But the China does not take it th that way. And so, so I'm, I'm really frustrated with the way the Chinese media never reported this kind of you know, actual you know, fact, ha what happened. And so if that media could really uh, play a constructive role is to really report the fact, what happened. Then, you know, being different from the government official line, then probably we can play a, a you know, role to uh, mitigate uh, the tension. Thank you. Yeah, I think the role of the media is, is very interesting, not just the Chinese and Japanese media, but also the, the Western media. And, and what role does the Western media, does the Western media inflame tensions and, and make things worse or not and that kind of thing? Or the way um, perhaps we cover it sometimes in a more superficial way than uh, because we're forced to in, in, in these times and days. Um, I'm very sorry, but I'm, uh, I'm going to call this session to a close. Um, I have to run to the airport. Um, but thank you to all my <laughs> panelists for, for being here, and thank you for being a great audience, and uh, hope you enjoyed the discussion. And a big round for Ken also. Uh, thank you very much.